Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. Sorry this episode is late. I was having computer problems and wasn't able to record last week. But that's fixed now, and I'm back on schedule. The next episode will come out next week as normal. So, let's get to it. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 25, Strange New Worlds. This episode isn't only about a certain TV show. As with most of what we talk about in this podcast, this was a broader trend. While much of the genre of science fiction was looking inward in the 60s, some writers were still looking to the stars, envisioning a future where we could explore the galaxy and all the strange things we might find there. In some ways, exploring outer space was the idea of the older generation of the Golden Age. But some writers carried on the tradition while carrying the new social ideas of the new wave with them. This allowed a greater flexibility, and, as with Star Trek, writers were able to discuss human issues in new ways by holding up an alien mirror to them. Frankly, that was never so much the appeal to me personally. At least not consciously so. For me, the rule of cool is strong with stories about space travel. But a fun story that also makes you think is, if anything, even better, and both factors are important. This is actually one of my favorite types of science fiction, something I've referred to several times in the past as its own subgenre of quote-unquote strange new worlds sci-fi. This can be like Star Trek, visiting the planet of the week, or stories that immerse you entirely in an alien world, like several of the books we'll be discussing in this episode. Either way, it gives you a perspective that you don't often encounter on Earth, or even in our solar system. Unfortunately, i found it's difficult to pull off well, because it lends itself to a more episodic structure. But there are definitely gems out there. This strange new world sci-fi is something that didn't come up much in the genre for a long time. Yes, many science fiction stories were set in exotic places on other planets, or featured alien life forms of all descriptions. But there were very few of these stories that were really about exploring. To see what I mean, compare Jules Verne with the early pulp writers. Jules Verne, at his core, was writing travelogues, even though he was calling them romans de la science, scientific novels. For all the science he packed into them, his stories were very much about the journey. After Verne, not so much. In the pulp era and early television, you had a lot of space ranger type stories. Buck Rogers, the Lensman, and so forth. Even Edgar Rice Burroughs, who was known for stories set in exotic locales, had John Carter fighting bad guys on Mars as a pseudo-superhero, not admiring the scenery. There wasn't a lot of this in the Golden Age either, surprisingly. You had Bradbury and Asimov telling tales of space colonization and building empires, sometimes with Martians involved, but not exploring the galaxy. This is a subtle difference, but I think it's an important one. One common plot line in this subgenre is one where the setting is the story in some large part. Man versus nature in the theory of narrative conflict. This is maybe a little off. I'm not sure how you parse that when intelligent aliens are involved, although you could define the setting broadly to include a whole alien civilization. This isn't a debate about narrative conflict, though. The main point is that you see surprisingly little of those alien civilizations in the golden age of sci-fi. Why did this happen? Part of this trend of a human-only galaxy can be attributed to everyone's favorite magazine editor, not... John W. Campbell. We just can't get away from that guy, can we? Isaac Asimov recalled that early in his career, Campbell rejected one of his stories because he didn't like that aliens were portrayed as superior to humans. It's probably not surprising that as an open racist, Campbell was a speciesist as well. He wanted humans to be on top. Not wanting to start a fight with Campbell, Asimov chose to write his two biggest series, robot, and foundation without any aliens at all. Meanwhile, his big alien-centric book, The Gods Themselves, didn't come out until after Campbell's death. I can't find any authoritative sources about this being Campbell's general policy, although it seems likely. 
and the online encyclopedia of sci-fi does describe him as slanting the presentation of aliens in literature for at least a decade. I don't think this was the only reason for this trend. And in fact, I don't even think aliens are a strict necessity for strange new worlds. But as the genre opened up more in the 60s, I think there was more room for both of those things. There are always exceptions, of course. And you can find strange new worlds before the new wave. Olaf Stapledon's future histories come close. Indeed, large parts of Star Maker consist of the narrator traveling around and exploring some of the most exotic civilizations in the genre through astral projection. Moreover, the first well-known modern example of this trope is probably Hal Clement's Mission of Gravity, which I recommended in episode 11 when we first looked at the Golden Age. A story about a human expedition to a planet with gravity hundreds of times greater than Earth, and meeting the centipede-like beings who live there. That, of course, wasn't New Wave, but it was one of the few Golden Age novels where, in large part, the setting was the story. Fred Hoyle's The Black Cloud is sort of along these lines, too, although that one is more about the universe coming to us. But I think these are the exceptions that prove the rule, because it's not until the 60s when this more philosophical, sociological style of science fiction became popular that you get more of this kind of setting-centric narrative. And note that I said the setting was the story. I think a second pitfall of Strange New Worlds, in addition to the episodic pacing, is when it takes it too far and makes the setting the quote-unquote main character, as Brian Aldiss did in his Heliconia trilogy. Again, I think this is subtly different, but important, and harder to pull off. Star Maker does it well, but for the most part, I think these stories would benefit from being more actual character-focused, as Mission of Gravity is. That said, the first major new wave example of Strange New Worlds is one that does make the setting the main character, and pulls it off by doing it very literally. I'm talking about Stanislaw Lem's Solaris from 1961, although it wasn't published in English until 1970. Polish author Stanisław Lem wrote a number of sci-fi novels and futurist essays, but in the West, he is by far best known for Solaris, which you may also know from the 2002 film adaptation starring George Clooney. Solaris, despite the name, has nothing to do with our sun, but is a planet. In Lem's story, Solaris is, well, a strange world, though not so new to the characters covered entirely in an ocean that is not made of water, but some sort of gel. The ocean appears to be alive in some way, but in decades of studying it, human scientists haven't been able to learn anything about it. Psychologist Chris Kelvin travels to Solaris to look after his friend, Dr. Gibarian, only to learn that Gibarian committed suicide just before he arrived. Soon after, Kelvin experiences impossible visitations from his wife, whom he also lost to suicide, along with other unexplained phenomena. It eventually emerges that all the researchers on Solaris are slowly going insane after the latest round of experiments finally got the ocean's attention. The ocean is indeed alive and intelligent, almost a living planet, but it's so alien to us that the only way it can communicate is by creating duplicates of people in our memories which still have only the barest ideas of the ocean's thoughts. These themes of the limitations of humans and the impossibility of communicating with and understanding an extraterrestrial intelligence are common ones in Lem's works. With no points of reference in common, he suggests, we couldn't hope to understand an alien race before one side or the other committed a fatal error. And in Solaris particularly, much of the story is really about Kelvin wrestling with his own inner demons. So these are all very new wave concepts. Meanwhile, the English-speaking world's introduction to this subgenre... Well, in Britain, it was arguably Doctor Who. But in America, looking at the timeline, I think it was in large part the 1965 epic science fantasy novel Dune by Frank Herbert. Dune is considered to be one of the signposts of the genre. Arthur C. Clarke reviewed it very highly, saying, quote, 
I know nothing comparable to it except for Lord of the Rings, unquote. Carl Sagan, who was normally all in for scientific accuracy, said it was among the few stories that, quote, are so tautly constructed, so rich in the accommodating details of an unfamiliar society, that they sweep me along before I even have a chance to be critical, unquote. It's frequently cited as one of the best-selling, if not the best-selling, sci-fi novel of all time. Although I'd like to know how they count that. I doubt anything beats Frankenstein. And I really didn't care for Dune. Okay, before I go into that, I should tell you what the story's about. Duke Leto Atreides is assigned by the Emperor of Human Space to take over the rulership of the planet Arrakis from Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Arrakis is a desert planet, where the only water has to be mined from the tiny ice cap. It's inhabited by giant sandworms, and is the only source of a valuable mineral called the Spice, which gives humans mystical mental powers. Harkonnen is angry at losing Arrakis to his longtime enemy, and arranges to kill Leto. However, Leto's concubine Jessica and his son Paul flee into the desert. Jessica is a member of the Bene Gesserit, a politically active group of women with mystical powers like genetic memory, mind control, and predicting the future. And Paul realizes that, unusually, he has inherited those same powers from his mother. And all that's in just book one of three. I'd say it's all very Game of Thrones, but I haven't actually read or watched Game of Thrones, so I'm just guessing there. Anyway, it's a huge work in scope, and although it includes many fantasy elements, the world building is careful, detailed, and self-consistent. And the science of the desert planet is explored in depth. This strange world feels real. The history is well developed. The Butlerian Jihad that forbade intelligent computers, the consolidation of religions in the Orange Catholic Bible, and so forth. There are some quirks in the science parts. Like, the sandworm's metabolism makes no sense. And shooting a laser at a personal shield will cause a nuclear explosion? But this was 1965, when lasers were new and exotic, and not something you'd find just lying around, so I can give him that one. However, I still didn't care much for Dune. It wasn't so much that it was more fantasy than sci-fi. It didn't take it as far as Star Wars did. I just didn't think it was that interesting. Not to mention the hard left turn at the end of book one. I actually liked the political intrigue of book one more than the weird, quasi-spiritual journey of the rest of the story. Also, I noticed that Herbert tends to gloss over things in weird ways. Like, suddenly Paul and Chani are together, and I'm thinking, whoa, when did that happen? Or when Aaliyah calls herself a reverend mother, which should have major implications, but she's interrupted and it's never mentioned again. Or even the last line of the book. It felt wrong in a way that tripped me up, like a song that's cut off right before the last bar. It feels like Herbert had some odd linguistic patterns that detracted from the quality of his prose, and between that and the overall plot, I couldn't get into it like so many other people have. Still probably worth seeing the movie that's scheduled to come out this October, though. And for the record, Dune also spawned many sequels by both Frank Herbert and his son, but those are considered to be of varying levels of quality. Another popular series about an alien world from this time period, one with a similar science fantasy aesthetic, in fact, is Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern series. I admit I only read the first book in this series, Dragonflight, and that is not considered to be McCaffrey's best work. But I didn't continue with this series for a different reason which is that I think Dragonflight revealed a serious structural flaw with the series as a whole. I'm not trying to be critical here. I can name books in this subgenre that I do like. It's just bad luck that some of the most prominent ones didn't work for me. McCaffrey's planet Pern is inhabited by human colonists and native dragons, which look an awful lot like the dragons of Earth, specifically European, legends except that they're structured like ants with a single queen in each nest, or weir. And that they have the ability to teleport by jumping through extra dimensions. Pern is also afflicted by the Threads, 
a deadly, fungus-like life form that crosses the vacuum of space from a planet on an elliptical orbit every 200 years or so, and destroys everything it touches on the ground. To fight the threads, humans ride the dragons, teleporting to the sites of thread falls to destroy them with fire. The riders are telepathically bonded to their dragons, something that may be familiar to readers of Aragon and other more recent fantasy works. On the surface, Dragonflight looks like a pure fantasy story. But even then, it's a fantasy story that includes space aliens, so it's not exactly standard fare. However, the prologue and a few clues in the story indicate that the humans of Pern are descendants of colonists who have lost their advanced technology. The story itself revolves around Lessa, a noblewoman who gives up her ancestral fiefdom to become the rider of the new Dragon Queen. When Pern suffers from a critical underpopulation of dragons as the next Threadfall begins, Lessa discovers the lost art of teleporting through time and brings the mysterious vanished riders of the past forward to the present to help. And this is the fundamental structural flaw I was talking about. I saw a comment on Reddit once that I've really taken to heart. It said, more or less, Time travel ruins any story that's not specifically about time travel. And I think there's no better case for that than Dragonflight. The time travel element was not necessary to the plot, and not only does it almost completely negate the stakes, they can go back and mop up anything they missed even without changing the past, it means that the dragon riders were the ones who got themselves into that predicament out of some misplaced sense of machismo. Well, that's probably unfair, but that's the vibe I got from the old-timers who were so eager to keep on fighting when I view the story through a modern lens. Lessa herself is just too desperate to have help against the threads in the present to think about the implications that she's the one who caused the weirs to become depopulated in the first place. Like all rules of writing, there are exceptions to this. Avengers Endgame was not specifically about time travel, and yet it was actually one of the best treatments of time travel I've seen in fiction. It was able to use alternate timelines in a way that was logically consistent and still kept the stakes high in the home timeline. In Pern, however, I felt that it was such a large flaw that I didn't bother with the rest of the series. As I said, this subgenre lends itself to an episodic format. And because of that, this is where television really starts to shine in sci-fi. The first incarnation might actually be the anthology series of The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits. However, more focused shows came in the following years. Doctor Who, which I've mentioned before, is the United Kingdom's preemptive answer to Star Trek, and the longest-running sci-fi show of all time, produced continuously from 1963 to 1989, and from 2005 to the present, able to constantly reinvent itself by recasting its lead character every few years. Early in the show's history, they came up with the clever trick of making the Doctor an immortal alien who wore a succession of different faces, and it's kept the show going for nearly 60 years. Doctor Who is only half Strange New Worlds, though. Since they travel in a time machine, Half the episodes take place in various parts of Earth's history. Also, the show is very conflict-driven. As the characters themselves sometimes say, there's an awful lot of running involved. That's why my go-to for Strange New World sci-fi is, unsurprisingly, Star Trek. Now, I've criticized Star Trek a few times in this podcast for its sloppy writing and even sloppier science, but I do it out of love. I'm a big Star Trek fan. I even like it better than Star Wars. Sorry, not sorry. It's the trope namer for Strange New Worlds, and at its best, it embodies everything that's good about the subgenre. Captain Kirk lays out the whole point in the opening voiceover, quote, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before, or in the next generation where no one has gone before. And it's worth noting that this sentiment was taken from a real-world White House booklet on space exploration written in reaction to the Sputnik launch. This was very much part of the culture at the time. Star Trek is definitely where the Planet of the Week concept came from, too. Every episode, they take the warp drive to a different planet and meet the strange people who lived there, usually humans in funny makeup due to budget constraints. 
but still alien civilizations, often with powers we don't understand. And sometimes they found all but unrecognizable beings that were life but not as we know it. And yes, sometimes the Enterprise would get into fights with the Klingons or the Romulans or the one-off enemy of the week. And the red-shirted security officers had an unfortunate tendency to die planetside. Actually, there was quite a lot of fighting in Star Trek. But despite that, it was still fundamentally a show about exploring. It wasn't like Doctor Who, where they were always crusading for justice. As Peter Capaldi's incarnation of the Doctor said, I don't know what to do if it's not an evil plot. Captain Kirk didn't have that problem. And not just when there was an attractive alien female involved. The original Star Trek was produced for three years, from 1966 to 1969. It was created by Gene Roddenberry, a freelance screenwriter and a fan of Golden Age sci-fi authors like A.E. Van Vaught and Eric Frank Russell. Roddenberry imagined a sci-fi adventure series, something he referred to as, quote, Horatio Hornblower in Space, unquote, after C.S. Forrester's popular novels about a swashbuckling sea captain. He later pitched it as, quote, Wagon Train to the Stars, unquote, after the then popular Western TV series Wagon Train, something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense today. The voyages of the Starship Enterprise are a lot more like a sailing ship than any kind of Western. But the Adventure of the Week episodic format was familiar and filled a similar niche. But one thing Roddenberry was very dedicated to from the outset was his commitment to social justice. By 1960s standards, if there's any confusion. Part of his original idea for the show was a multi-ethnic crew, which ended up including a Scotsman, an Asian man, an African woman, an alien, and, in season two, a Russian man as a contrast to the ongoing Cold War. The show is credited with featuring the first interracial kiss on American television, although that's a bit complicated. And more generally, it featured a black woman as the chief communications officer and fourth in command. Or at least that's what Martin Luther King Jr. told Nichelle Nichols when she was considering leaving the show. Actually, I'm just going to link Neil deGrasse Tyson's interview with Nichelle Nichols on Star Talk. You can go listen to that when you're done with this. There's a lot of great history there that I don't have time to get into. Meanwhile, the first pilot episode, The Cage, cast a woman as the first officer, then known only as Number One, a name fans of The Next Generation will recognize. Infamously, she was written out of the show after that. In fact, Spock was the only character to return from The Cage. Roddenberry always claimed that the studio didn't like a woman in such a high-ranking role. However, producer Herb Solow claimed that the real reason was that the studio was angry at Roddenberry for casting his girlfriend in the part, and that she wasn't a very good actress. In any case, the character did appear when they reused the footage in the later episode, The Menagerie. Besides all that, the scripts often commented on the social issues of the day. Let That Be Your Last Battlefield featured an almost absurdist allegory for racism. Aliens who are half black and half white divided over which side of their body was the black one. You have to wonder how they felt looking in a mirror. Anti-war themes show up in episodes like The Doomsday Machine, and secularist themes, which Roddenberry was very much in favor of, appeared in episodes like Who Mourns for Adonais? And honestly, there's a lot more I could talk about that I don't have time to mention here. And this trend of social commentary only continued in the later series. You can find other podcasts and commentaries online that explore Star Trek in greater depth. The upshot is that the Strange New World subgenre allowed Roddenberry and his successors to discuss social issues in a way that was either a step removed from the heated political debate, or did it in new ways that aren't possible with an all-human cast. Interestingly, for all this, Star Trek's ratings in its original run were not great, and it might have become a footnote in history had NBC not half-heartedly given it a third season in response to a letter-writing campaign, which gave it just enough episodes for syndication. But although Star Trek's fan base was small, it was unusually dedicated and unusually educated, with many of its supporters being doctors, scientists, teachers, and the like. 
Its popularity grew in syndication as it was moved to more kid-friendly time slots. In 1972, the first Star Trek convention was held, and by 1979, in the wake of the popularity of Star Wars, it was given its first movie, and the rest is history. Today, it's hard to overestimate Star Trek's legacy. In addition to its social commentary, it inspired many people to careers in science and technology. Many NASA scientists, technology entrepreneurs, and even STEM professionals in less related fields grew up watching Star Trek, including me. It's even left a mark on how we interact with real-world science and technology. Consider, for example, the first ever widely sold flip phone, which was modeled after Captain Kirk's communicator, the Motorola StarTac. Ironically today, flip phones are obsolete, long since replaced by smartphones. And within the genre itself, Star Trek didn't give us the science fiction convention. Those date back to the 1939 World's Fair. But it did popularize them. So that today, the Star Trek convention is one of the best known such events. Perhaps second only to Comic Con. And one other thing you might not think about so much. It was Star Trek, in large part, that gave us fan fiction as we know it today. I've mentioned before about sci-fi fanzines. Small press, often free magazines produced by sci-fi fans and amateur writers. Most notably Ray Bradbury in his early work. But Star Trek's dedicated fan base led to many Star Trek-specific fanzines. The earliest of which, Spockanalia, dates back to during the show's original run. These fanzines contained the earliest well-known examples of fan fiction as non-commercial, fan-written stories based on a popular franchise, distinct from the earlier generation's unofficial sequels, the kind of thing people could get away with more back when copyright wasn't as strictly enforced. Fan fiction itself wasn't a new phenomenon. I've linked an article from Shannon Chamberlain in The Atlantic pointing out that the patterns we see in today's fan fiction, both clean and explicit, appear at least as far back as Gulliver's Travels. However, it was the Star Trek fanzines that brought it into public awareness. The Star Trek fanzines also gave us the Mary Sue trope, which takes its name from Lieutenant Mary Sue, the star of A Trekkie's Tale, a parody story that made fun of all the poorly written stories about young, brilliant junior officers who were the most competent members of their crews and suspiciously resembled perfected versions of their writers. You can form your own opinions about Wesley Crusher, who was one of the last creations of Eugene Wesley Roddenberry. Moving on, there are a few other examples of the Strange New Worlds trope from the 60s. There's Brian Aldiss's Hot House, which I mentioned in the introduction to the New Wave in episode 19, and Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness, which we'll get to in a couple episodes. Going into the 70s and beyond, even though Star Trek was done for the time being, there were a lot more stories about strange new worlds. We'll talk about some of them in the episode on Larry Niven, as well as others. But I want to mention one that I consider to be one of the best standalone examples of the subgenre, even though it's not exactly a typical one. Inverted World by Christopher Priest. Inverted World, sometimes styled The Inverted World, was one of the early novels of Christopher Priest, who is perhaps better known for The Prestige, as well as the novelizations of the films Short Circuit, Mona Lisa, and David Cronenberg's Existence. The story is set in a mobile city called Earth, which is pulled along on giant train tracks through an alien world where space and time seem to bend around it in bizarre ways. You can tell right from the famous opening line, quote, I had reached the age of 650 miles, unquote, that something very weird is going on. The story follows Hellward, one of the surveyors who charts the courts of the city as they struggle to keep it in the optimum, where space and time are the least distorted. But slowly, we learn about the nature of this world, until we realize that it might not be the most alien thing around after all. Unlike the other books I mentioned, I found Inverted World to be fun and engaging and it hits that sweet spot of a really good story played out in an alien setting. And because of that, I'm going to make it my book recommendation for this episode. I don't think it needs any more explanation than that. 
like going down past, it's something you really need to see to understand. Minor warning for some mature content, but nothing a high schooler can't handle. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is very likely available on your favorite podcasting platform if you're not there already. You can also find me on YouTube and at my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com, where you can also read about my latest scholarly co-authored paper, which, believe it or not, has to do with alternate universes. As a reminder, the next episode will be in one week to put the show back on our normal schedule. And in that episode, we will return to one of the roots of sci-fi, with the modern satire stylings of Kurt Vonnegut and Douglas Adams. Thanks for listening.